You know it's Kamala running the country when the feds lock up kids before giving stimulus checks to average Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ruthless. Democrats are set to take control of the U.S. Senate, House, and the White House. This will go down as one of the most progressive administrations in American history. God willing, everything is on the table. You now can pass things without a filibuster threat. That's right. Oh, you regret this? And you may regret it a lot sooner than you think. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. Well, good Thursday to you and all the listeners of the Variety Program. It's, it's going to be another banger. Uh, that Ted Cruz episode really got a lot of attention, didn't it? You know, um, we always expect that our listenership is going to be terrific. What we don't always expect is the mainstream media pickup uh, like we had on Tuesday. Good Lord. Yeah. I mean, we got to say right off the bat, thank you to all the minions who are loyal listeners. Thank you to uh, Senator Ted Cruz for appearing on the show. Thank you to all the hate listeners, uh, you know, who angrily listen to our podcast. I think my favorite is, is picturing in my head the Media Matters kid who's sitting in his basement, sweatpantsing it up, you know, like just, just off his rocker enraged listening. Furious. You're like, he hates us with a thousand sons and he's got to listen to every single word. And, you know, we, we would be remiss if we didn't say a thank you to the reigning champion of our King of the Hill game on this variety program, Matthew Dowd, who, who was on CNN the other night taking a victory tour after he'd won <laughs> the Tuesday episode. So, Smug, I, in fairness, I think Matthew Dowd should thank us. Uh, right? Yeah, revived his career. He's run dry in his career. Uh, he has left ABC News. No explanation. Uh, that relationship was terminated. Uh, I don't know anything more about it, frankly. But I do know he's, he's just sort of been cast adrift, and I didn't quite know what had happened to him until he became our champion, two-time champion, I might add. Two-time champ. And then the full circle was completed last night as he is on CNN's Aaron Burnett doing a commentary and analysis on the ruthless interview with Ted Cruz. Isn't that so, amazing? So, so do, you, do you think he actually listened to the episode before he got that? That uh, oh, he had to spot have. on CNN. He absolutely had to have. You think so? I don't know, man. He's <sighs> in such a fragile place. You can tell by his Twitter account. Like, I think if he would have listened to the full game show, I'm not sure he'd have been able to keep it together for me. <laughs> you know? Brutal. I don't know, man. It just doesn't seem. Look, I hope he's. I hope he's great. Let me just disclose that. I, I hope he's doing great. But you take a look at his Twitter feed. There's some reason to be skeptical. I mean, the guy's a champ. What can you say? <laughs> he's, he's, he's dropping the takes beat Jan Rubin I mean that should tell you a lot about his frame of mind he beat he beat Jen Rubin soundly in, a, in our first and only 2-0 sweep right that well I have impressive. to I, I have to say there I have to say typically you know there's a little bit of controversy and I usually hear it in my in my mentions on Twitter that that I made a bad ruling as judge and jury but uh this week Everyone seems to be in agreement. Yeah, which, he, which brought happy. he brought it. And I it. can't I, look. I'm, I'm, I accept the L. I feel like that was a level that I don't typically see played in a week. And as we said, any given week, any seven day period, you can find somebody to win. And, and but you know he's done it back to back, so you got to take a cap off. And that's the thing is also you know uh, the show keeps going up. Like our lineup that we have, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil. For the listeners, but we've got the guest list is 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 pretty top notch. Yeah, we got I mean, coming up, folks. You can you can probably tell. Let's first talk about today's guest, which um, who do we have today? Yeah, so so Janice Dean, the Weather Machine. Let's go. Is with us, and we all have loved her for years because, uh, frankly, she's just awesome. She's a good person, quality person. She does the weather on Fox News, and has written books that you know, many of our listeners have, have read children's books, which my kids are really into, but she uh, unfortunately lost both of her in-laws, her, mm. her husband's mother and father in New York in a nursing home within two weeks of each other. And it has turned her from being 
you know, just a warm on air uh, personality, which she still is to someone who's involved herself in politics and gotten in particular involved in trying to uh, hold Governor Cuomo accountable, which you'll see in the interview, you'll hear in the interview. I mean, she's just awesome. I just, yeah. I really, really have a lot of admiration. And, and, and truly, I mean, she was a crusader calling out Cuomo for mismanaging that situation from the get go. Like it's only, only now over the past week or so, you're seeing the mainstream media catch on. It's like, huh? So, you know, they're, they're covering up the numbers that they were giving the feds. Clearly there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Only now you're hearing it from them, but from the get go, you know, Janice was on the case. So huge kudos to her. Yep. Yep. She's great. So we've got, I mean, look, this little program that could is, right. uh, is chugging on in. I mean, we, we've uh, basically we're covered everywhere in the English speaking world on Tuesday. And uh, our guest list, as Smug mentioned, is around the corner. We've got a ton of people that are booked here over the next couple of months, people that you, we think you're really going to enjoy uh, with serious conversations that can also laugh, right? They, and that, that's the key. We have, to, we have to try to keep it a little bit light and not be your typical sort of downtrodden bullshit broadcast. Like we'll, we'll, we'll keep it fun for you. And I love it. I mean, I'm having a blast talking to these folks, all smart people. And also, you know, this is the, the program is not only entertaining, it's impactful. And, and that's what I, I want to start. I want to start today's show with a little bit of a spike in the football on ladies and gentlemen, Nira Tandon's nomination to OMB is in peril. It's now, been delayed. Now, I will say, let me just say, we, we, on Tuesday's program, we said that if the nomination goes down, you will have a signature variety song. Uh, we're not counting any chickens until they're hatched. You noticed no song. So we're holding off on that. You'll get it when it happens, if it happens. Uh, but we don't want to jinx anything. As of today, as of yesterday, what's happened is the budget committee, and I believe it's Homeland Security is the other committee yep. that has it, both delayed their hearings and votes on her nomination, which is typically seen as a, a element of last resort to try to buy more time to find the votes. And I'll be honest, like almost every other administration I've, I've seen in, in years of doing this has thrown the towel in at that point. Yep. Not these idiots. They, they went double right back down into the sexism and the racism and how qualified she is, which is all just complete and utter nonsense. But that's where the White House and the Biden administration are headed in terms of trying to defend near attendance. And, and also, um, Politico ran a story, I don't know if you guys saw this, uh, about Bernie not getting a heads up on Neera Tandon being <laughs> yeah. the nominee. And folks at home are, are great listeners. When, when you start seeing stories like that, where people start pointing fingers yeah. before something's happened, typically it means not good. Not, not good, good, folks. Not good. Right? There, was also, there was also a story in Axios where it said that House Democratic leaders are quietly mounting a campaign for Shalanda Young, a longtime congressional aide, to replace Neera Tandon as nominee for director of the Office of Management saw that. and Budget. Yeah, I saw that. So, so they're trying to replace her already. I mean, literally the only person in the entire planet who wants Neera Tandon to do this job is Ron Klain. And you know what? I, I think it has to be said. Neera has to be ashamed. She's standing in the way of the first black woman leading OMB. This is a classic case of racism. <laughs> So, Nira, I am officially calling for you to step down from the nomination. Playing their own game against them, Smug. Let me, let me, let me just read a couple of things. There's, I get so angry, and I think a lot of the minions get angry when Democrats get their backs up against the wall, and anything, any kind of opposition is racist and sexist, right? Yep. It has nothing to do with the fact that this woman is the most intemperate nominee maybe in history. She's got a, a history of terrible management in her organization, violence uh, against people who she disagrees with. I mean, she's just fundamentally unfit for office. But nevertheless, we get the argument that, that we're all sexist and, and racist. Let me remind Senate Democrats of the women that they voted against. 
Every Democrat in the Senate voted against Betsy DeVos for her Secretary of Education. 43 Democrats voted against Gina Haspel at the CIA. 43 Democrats voted against Seema Verma, if you remember that one, at mm -hmm. CMS, both racist and sexist, I mm -hmm. might add. Mm -hmm. 38 Senate Democrats voted against Kelly Kraft, and 37 Senate Democrats voted against Kirsten Nielsen. Oh, but just a ton, rampant sexism. Totally. Rampant sexism. Absolutely. So the, the last piece I wanted, to, I wanted to focus on is because there is uh, one voice who has said that Senate Republicans should move forward, who's a conservative voice that I respect greatly, and that's Hugh Hewitt, which, by the way, I think just last week he said that you're basically uh, Rush Limbaugh for Twitter. I mean, what a, great, what a great guy. What a great comment. I mean- Such a, such a compliment. Such a compliment. But- so Hugh, we have great respect for. Uh, we love him. But he, we disagree with him on this piece because he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post that argued basically that you shouldn't have this new standard where you can just basically oppose nominees for what they've said on Twitter, however caustic that might be. I kind of agree with that. That's not our fundamental opposition to her. Correct. Right? And, and today on his radio show, he said basically that that, that would eliminate people like me from Senate confirmation. What I want to go on record. For, what a compliment. <laughs> I, I want to I go on record to say to both Duncan and Smug, if at any point it appears as though I am verging into territory that Neera Tandon has inhabited, I want you to rip my computer out of the wall. I want you to shut down and shutter my Twitter account. And I'd like you to look up and usher me into a, a nearby psychologist. Yeah. I mean, as, as a friend, I would, I would 100% be there if you ever went into near Tandon territory. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's such a cop out that the Dems tried pushing this as, oh, these are bad tweets. No. I mean, her behavior was out of control. She punched someone. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm dead serious. She punched Fizz Shocker for asking Hillary Clinton a question about the Iraq war. And yeah. who was an employee. Who's an employee? Like, she accused a Supreme Court justice and his son of engaging in a Russian collusion conspiracy to resign from the Supreme Court. She like, that's, outed, that's, this isn't that's mean tweets. There. This isn't mean tweets. No, she outed a member of her staff who had accused another staff member of sexual harassment at a team meeting. Yeah, she's, this is like, this is so beyond tweets. And that's the game that the Dems are trying to push is saying, Oh, this is about her tweets being bad. No, no. That's, that's a completely made up narrative that they're trying to push for cover. And you know what? Clearly it hasn't worked, folks. It has not worked. People aren't buying it and, and she's on the ropes. I think it's safe to say that we may even give you a special episode if sometime that we're not around a Tuesday or Thursday, mm -hmm. he goes down because we have been on this since day one. Day one. And we're going to stay on it. Hopefully we get to the finish line. If, uh, if you're not engaged already with your senator, please do so. Especially those folks in Alaska, give a call to Senator Murkowski, say, hey, we need you to make sure we don't have this, you know, vile person running OMB. So, okay, we're going to transition to a topic here. It's a little lighter. In some ways, actually, it's, it's quite depressing and very it's, happy about uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and so, I mean, that's a giveaway. It's got to be Hunter Biden, right? If it's, oh. if it's, if it's, it's funny, but dark and depressing, that's, that's the Hunter Biden story. It's the Hunter Biden segment, folks. The Daily Mail has blown our minds once again, Smug. <sighs> this is, this is really something else. <laughs> I, let me just say at the outset, before I get into the story itself, what has become abundantly clear to me is that Hunter Biden is a sexual pandemic. If you allow him into your space, into your family, he infects everyone. <laughs> everyone. The title of the Daily Mail story, exclusive. Hunter Biden was living with his brother Bo's widow, Hallie, while sending raunchy texts and FaceTiming her in the shower with her married sister as they declared their love and she called him her prince. So to keep track of this, while Hunter Biden is married, 
he's uh staying with hooking up i don't know what the term is dating yeah his dead brother's widow and also sending sex and facetiming and clearly there's got to be something else going there <laughs> with his brother's widow's sister I feel like we need one of those flow charts or like Seriously. wall diagrams with like like pins and string and y- y- yarn connecting these pins to these photographs on the wall. I mean, I'm getting my, confused. My first thought is like this guy, I mean, he's a talented guy to be able to keep track of all this in his head on the fly, like the situations he's got to be in, like don't call anyone the wrong name. <laughs> For him to be able to keep track of all this while he was just like, I mean... On a oh, number of substances. We haven't even included the DC stripper, which he fathered a child with in this Correct. same time frame. Correct. Which is, I mean. Those, so there's more. Just a prolific guy. You know, I'm going to have to say, you know, after reading this article, we're going to get into the details, but it just, at a certain level, there's, there's got to be admiration because this is a guy who just loves the game. He loves the game. He's got to be in it. He's in it to win it. There is no limitation in his mind of what is okay, what isn't okay. He's, he's, it's like Will Chamberlain, man. He's just like, he's really trying to be the top person in his profession, put up the high score. Yeah, I mean, depending upon your perspective, he is either the worst human being that's ever lived or the best. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's no in between. I, I think there might be some in between there. <laughs> you know. I we guess got, my, my, my one comment here would be just, this is a full-time job. What he's engaging That's the in, thing. like, yeah. like, like sp- he's spinning a lot of plates at once. And I just got to say, like, I would be exhausted trying to do this for a week, let alone as long as this guy's been in the game. This is obscene. So let me, let me just, I, I read the whole article about 15 times because the first 14, I couldn't get the sequencing down for the life of me. There's yeah. too many women there's too many relatives. There are there there is overlap in time frame. I can't tell who's married to who. Nothing but names, right? I mean, it's just a mess. So I went back and I tried to pull some things out of the copy of the Daily Mail to help us frame the time frame here. He's married to a woman named Kathleen. Their marriage becomes on the rocks in like October of 2015. They ultimately divorced in April of 2016. Now, Haley. Hallie, Hallie or Haley, is Bo's wife. And at, he passes away in 2015. The allegation there is that Hunter begins dating her almost immediately. That's, right? that's what this article says quite clearly, right? It says right. the day after the funeral, they engaged in, in, you know. Well, that's the allegation, right? That's the allegation that's in the, in the texts. Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't. Far According to the Daily Mail folks. According to the other mail. So, so our lawyers, our lawyers are going to be really happy to hear that. Correct. Uh, we have cited our source. It's good, the Daily Mail, highly respected right. publication. Right. right. So, but the point is, is like he's still married technically, and now he's with his deceased brother's wife, which, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that you could end the story there and we got a real problem. That's something. Right. That's a real problem. But we've all kind of known that part of the story. The new part is that while he gets in, in, involved, further involved with Hallie, Bo's wife, he begins this sort of sexting relationship with Hallie's sister, Elizabeth, sending her text messages. So Amazing. he's got like a three-way thing going on, all in the family. Guys, guys, is, always, guys always looking somewhere else. The grass is, is always so greener somewhere wild. else. That is so wild. Like, I mean, here's the thing is that I think most people, when you attend a funeral, it's terrible, awful, awful situation. Bo, Bo is on the prowl. He's, he's like, he's like, <laughs> it's a scouting situation for him. <laughs> it's just, oh awful. my God. It's just <laughs> awful. I'm like, I, I swear to God, we all have people and like friends that we, we have or whatever. They're just sort of dirt bags and you kind of laugh mm-hmm. at them because of mm-hmm. whatever. You definitely don't try to emulate him. This guy's so far beyond anyone I've ever met. He's like met the king life. of that friend. He, he, he's, like, <laughs> he's the guy that by the time you're like 25 or 26, 
your every one of your other friends are like, yeah, I kind of don't like hanging around yeah. that guy. And your wife and girlfriend is totally not cool with him coming over at right. all. That's right. Hunter Biden. But there's like, there's a big difference between juggling a few romantic uh, partners in college and like this sort yeah. of behavior, yeah. which is <laughs> your brother's <laughs> widow and brother's <laughs> widow's sister. Everyone, While still married, but he was still technically married. He was still married at the time. Everyone in this conversation is married. Blew my mind. I wow. Mean, wow. Sexual I, pandemic. Hunter Biden. A sexual pandemic. A sexual pandemic. It's like, it's like a fire in a dry wheat field. You know, it just rips through it. And I, I, I want to highlight one text from the Daily Mail. Oh, God. That the Daily Mail obtained. And I will... I will judiciously censor this above hunter writes quote by the way i'm going to have five strippers naked and admiring my bleep back to my hotel tonight and i'm going to smoke crack and drink enough to kill an elephant (laughs) imagine sending that text out (laughs) <laughs> I'm just gonna 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 preemptively apologize to Janice Dean for putting sure. her lovely interview adjacent to this content. It's it's <laughs> it's truly horrific, truly horrific. It's so bad, I can't believe it. I, I, I I'll, the reason we have to do it is because we're the only ones that'll talk about it besides the Daily Mail. Well, that's right. And, and and the entire remember the entire press corps prior to the election decided to band together. That's the thing. And call the content that we're talking about now that's now out into the open, mm-hmm. call it Russian propaganda. Yep. That's, that's, the, that's the big thing here, folks, is it's not just that Hunter Biden <laughs> was really living it up. It's that the entire press corps colluded. They united and they, ha- they formed a blockade of information from the American people. And if anyone tried to discuss this, they would get – like the New York Post, folks – had their account frozen for reporting on this, which we all now know as fact. And the mainstream media told you this is Russian disinformation and they banded together to prevent this information from getting out. That is what is the most disturbing about a Hunter Biden story. And that says a lot. That says a lot. That says a lot. So here's the deal. In order to see, like we didn't even become close to covering the details yeah. of this particular <laughs> article because frankly we have some class here on the program <laughs> i'm wondering if that phone call was from the lawyer like okay guys <laughs> you gotta cite the source you can't say it you can't Seriously, say it it's like, so I, I welcome all the adults listening to to check out that article because i mean we cannot read it we no, absolutely we can't, can't read this on air. we can't we cannot we cannot do that we cannot do that so anywho uh you gotta go to the daily mail to check it out it's worth the read, but you're going to want to make sure that you are just in an adult content consuming yeah. mode because pour yourself a drink. It's explicit. Go on some jazz. <laughs> read the hundred text. So without further ado, we need moderate Jeff to play us a new game show. Who said it? Okay. Ooh. Okay. It's a variety program, folks. We got a new we got a new game for the show. Duncan, what and what do we have here? Uh well, this is gonna be a fun one. Uh and for our uh you know hardcore uh, ruthless listeners, you may remember we um you know one time played a game called uh you know Spot the Dem Operative, where we read all these tweets um, you know, from journalists just like effuse with praise for Biden and then tried to spot the Dem operative out of a group of four tweets. This is sort of like that game. It's a little bit different. What I'm going to do here is read a series of statements um, on, you know, child migration and immigration um, and Smug and Holmes are going to have to determine whether this statement was made by someone in the Trump administration or the Biden administration. Oh. Ooh. Is there a topic? So did I miss it? Was there a topic that these are going to yeah, be Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 um, it's child separation, immigration, oh, uh, detention at the border. Yeah. So the, 
And uh, as they're now known, I believe the, the correct nomenclature is children in a overflow. chain link steel fortified <laughs> overflow safety windowless facility. They post the talking points on the door. <laughs> That's right. Overflow right. facility. The most important thing is that the cages are six feet apart for COVID. Well, that's exactly right. You know, you, you got to social distance the kids in the cages. <laughs> because you got to give Joe Biden that. He's following the science. You put the kids in the cages, but you better social distance them. <laughs> Lord knows if you've traveled 3,000 miles by foot, uh, <laughs> what you'd like to have is some social separation. <laughs> <laughs> Just that in and of itself, think about the absurdity of that. It is unbelievable. You got unbelievable. Co- you got coyotes smuggling you through like the most dangerous parts of the world. You arrive at the at the U.S. border, and they're like, "Oh my God, you, me without my mask." Right. I, I mean, at the, uh, before we get a segment, that's just the the absolute absurdity of this. Is we were told this is a crime against humanity. This is not who we are. It's it, it's gone further than it even was before. Now they need overflow facilities. Like Kamala and Joe were locking up the kids at that rate that like, hey, they're breaking records on the kids in cages. This is a uniquely good idea for a game. game. It's really something, right? Let's, uh, Let's read the first statement. It's a detention space, as you know, that has existed for decades. It's larger. It has facilities. There are places to sit, to stand, to lay down. Trump or Biden administration? Ooh. Who do you want to go first? You know, I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. God, that's tough. My guess is Trump administration. So. I, you know what I like? I, I like that Smug didn't elaborate. He doesn't want to. I don't, I don't want to clue him away because I may have some kind of like tell or something and i don't want homes well up i can it. talk through the, i can talk through the rationale because i'm going to also it. say trump okay and the reason that i'm saying that is because they certainly had to put a certain emphasis on the previous usage of the facility mm. right mm-hmm. because the biden administration doesn't want you to believe that they're doing the same thing as the trump administration the Trump administration wanted you to believe they were doing the same thing. So, so by citing its decades long use, I say Trump administration. And you're both correct. Boom. And you know what? I, I got to agree with Josh. There is, is the granular nature of, for me of like, there's room for the kids to sit, you know, whatever, because I remember it got so ridiculous where they were like, Oh, we had members of Congress going and inspecting the bathroom facilities. Yeah. To make sure that they were up to snuff, you know. And now you don't hear about any of that. There's no there's no member of Congress going on. Don't down you there. remember the field trips that they took? They were down Absolutely. There, like, like literally just staring at the people. Oh, yeah. Like they were at the zoo or something. It was the most dehumanizing thing I've ever totally. seen. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Oh, that's not happening anymore because these are now Biden overflow safety detention metal fortified. Basically a luxury resort. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> same same facility. So that's 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 one to one for Holmes and Smug. All right. We now have our second statement. These short term facilities do not employ the use of cages to house minors. Certain facilities make use of barriers in order to separate minors of different genders and age groups for the safety of those who are being held. Now, that's tough. That is super tough. That's tough. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a wild approach to this. I'm going to say Trump. And I'm not basing that on any sort of fact or tell. It's just like a, when you're in Vegas betting black or red. I think it's going to be black twice in a row. It's an interesting strategy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th- that's, called, that's like the gambler's fallacy. But total, uh, total. I'm just gambling on this one. <laughs> Coin flip. <laughs> <laughs> given given the, the way that he's made his decision, I should go the other way. Here's what I'm weighing. Barriers to me seems like a word that Democrats would like to avoid. Right? They they mm. were they certainly wouldn't say wall. 
They can't say cage. Mm-hmm. Barriers is a little, I don't know, you know? I mean, I feel like if I'm a Democrat, I say different room or a... Uh, Childcare facility space. <laughs> yeah, some, some kind of like a, an accommodation yeah. of sorts, <laughs> right? I'm going to stick with the Trump on this one too. Wow, you guys are both right again. Yeah. See, let me tell you, folks, that's how you bet in Vegas. Every time. Wow. Every time. It always works. How will works. these two champions be separated? Let's go. That's awesome. Um, okay, so statement number three. And now they cannot find over 500 sets of those parents and those kids are alone. Wait, 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 wait. This is a spokesperson for either the Trump administration or the Biden administration. This isn't a campaign comment. Wow. No, no this, this, is, this is a spokesman for the Trump administration or the Biden administration. Can we do, can you repeat one more time? Yeah. And now they cannot find over 500 sets of those parents. And those kids are alone. I'm doing it again. I'm doing it again. I'm going Trump because I have no clue, but this is how it goes. Folks, you know, when you're in Vegas, it's 2 a.m. You've had a few drinks. It's, it never goes, you know, it never flips red, black, red. You're always going to get them one after the other. I'm going Trump <laughs> betting on black. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So my thinking on this is that is most certain, that sentence has most certainly been said by almost every Democratic in the country in critique of the Trump administration. So it would be beyond believable that the Trump administration itself said this about the previous administration, which by the way, it would also be true. So knowing a little bit about the policy, I think Smug's right. It's Trump. It was, in fact, Donald Trump who said that. Himself? Boom. Yep. Oh! Boom. Oh, that's good. And, that's and amazing. also, we are excellent at this game. You're very good. <laughs> I like how you're employing, like, thought, reason, and sound tactics and years of experience. And I'm just like, all th- folks, all smug folks you got to bet on black. <laughs> <laughs> smug, smug, smug likes feelings, intuition, and magic. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Oh, good. So we've tied. Well, we got more. We oh, got a tiebreaker. More. Okay, that's awesome. We've that's got awesome. more. You know what? Here, here. I'm gonna go before it's even red. I'm gonna go with my gambler feel. <laughs> I'm gonna say Biden. He's just playing Russian. I'm saying Biden. He doesn't even <laughs> care. He's just going to pull the trigger. But you got to use the one you're going to use. Okay. okay. That's fair. I had my, my, my cursor over it. So this, this is a facility that was open that is going to follow the same standards as other HHS facilities. That was open. That was opened. It, well, oh, ho, ho, okay. Here's the tell. The tell is HHS facilities because Democrats like to hire, like to hide behind the healthcare component uh-huh. Uh-huh. of what almost certainly is a homeland security oh, yeah. and immigration issue, right? But it's a it's a human service is what is the way that they like. So I'm saying Biden. Correct again. Let's. You guys go. are on a roll. Let's go. On a roll. Wow. Folks, never listen to the facts. <laughs> <laughs> now, Smug, this one is really like... It, this is the killer. This is the one. This is the one that's going to break you. I'm actually going to listen to this. You know, I'm going to go I against think, my own intuition. I'll try I to think, I think maybe this is the last one we do. Okay. Um, and, and then hopefully there can be some separation here. I'm not sure. Well, we can always coin flip it at the end. Because, I mean, honestly, we're just very smart. <laughs> <laughs> all right here's the last one 
Now is not the time to come, and the vast majority of people will be turned away. <laughs> Let me try okay. to gather myself. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Smug? My guess is Trump. My guess is Trump. I'm going to say Biden. Mm. Those are final answers. Final answer. Holmes got it as Jen Psaki. Wow. Oh. She really said that? Yeah. I can't believe she said Incredible. that. That's great. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, that was a, guys, that was a photo finish. What That's what you get for game. listening. That's what you get for listening. I should have just... I should have just Guess right off the bat without even hearing it. It was a better move for you. Yeah, it worked. Right it worked for you. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. The fact well, that the fact that like it's almost discern. In you know, there's no way to discern between the two. Yeah, you guys uh, did a great job with the research. Yeah, seriously, that. That those are really great excellent. Polls. Incredible. <laughs> oh man. Well, let's play. Let's have moderate Jeff play the theme music out of here because what a wonderful game it was. Okay, we got a really big interview, one that we're extremely excited about. Janice Dean, the weather machine, is is as good as it gets. I want to get right to the interview. Janice Dean, I am so excited. We have wanted you on the program here for a long time and just have been huge admirers of you forever, uh, both for your work as the weather machine, where I think almost everybody knows you that listens to this particular pod, but also the good work you've been doing here in New York and, and holding Governor Cuomo accountable. So we just want to chat with you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, I wish we had some. I wish we had some uh, fancy adult beverages. Right, we got to start mixing that in. In post-COVID world, there's going to have to be some sort of bar setting where we can kind of. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm know, in. I will add before we get started. My three-year-old is an unbelievable fan of Freddy the Frogcaster. Yes, yes, <laughs> I love it. For those Bring of you who aren't back, familiar. Freddy. Uh, Janice wrote a, a children's book, Freddie the Frogcaster. If you have little, little ones, you should order it immediately. It captures their attention in a way that not a lot of kids' books do. So we really appreciate your, your help. <laughs> you are very welcome. I, you know, I'm thinking about my sixth Freddie the Frogcaster book. I have some ideas, so you could, you could tease your children with that. Oh, good. Okay, well, we'll maybe we'll contribute to some, some ideas for Freddie. That's, I like that. Excellent. Well, to get into, into serious business here for a minute, everyone I know who knows you thinks of you as a smart, thoughtful, warm, you know, not the typical sort of political brass knuckles person who's involved in kind of the ugliness of partisan politics. But you had a personal experience that's sort of driven you into this with the loss of your in-laws. And... Um, I'm wondering if you might just start us off by talking about that for a minute. Yes. So almost a year, it's been almost a year since we lost my husband's father uh, in a nursing home. That was the end of March. And then we lost his mom two weeks after that uh, in April. And we had no idea what was going to unfold. And when I look back, at how painful it was, first of all, to put them in elder care facilities. You know, my husband's parents lived in the same four-story walk-up in Brooklyn for over 50 years. It was rent controlled. It was very hard to get them to move. Uh, we wanted them to be in a house or a first, you know, first floor apartment building where they wouldn't have issues as they got older, but they never wanted to. And it got to the point where we had to bring AIDS to their apartment on a regular basis. And there were still trips to the ER. So we had a discussion with his mom because his dad was suffering from dementia. And we said, you know, we really need to have 24 hour care for you guys. 
And so we went around and we looked at nice places around the neighborhood so that we could visit them with our family. And, and we found a really nice assisted living residence very close to where we live on Long Island. And both of them were going to be together, but Mickey had some health issues. So he was in a nursing home rehab center. And, uh, and then COVID happened not long after they were in their, in their care facilities. We had no clue that his dad was even ill. He died on a Saturday afternoon and we got a call in the morning saying he wasn't feeling well. And three hours later, we get a call saying he was dead. Holy smokes. Did, didn't know he had died of COVID until the funeral director called us with, um, you know, the death certificate saying that he had died of COVID. Wow. Um, and then my husband had to tell his mom that his, her husband had died. That was the hardest thing he's ever had to do. She was heartbroken. You know, they, they would have been married for 60 years this month. And she got sick in her elder care facility um, and had to be transported to the hospital where they diagnosed her with COVID. And then she died several days after that. Mm. And I wasn't going to be a person to speak out about this. My husband is a very private person. He's not in this business. He's a firefighter, been one for 25 years. His father was a firefighter as well. So uh, they are a family of public service, but they're not people who, you know, particularly loved being on camera or in the news. But I didn't see the coverage of the nursing home issue. I was seeing bits and pieces in the newspaper and some of the local, um, on some of the local channels about Governor Cuomo's executive order to put infected patients in a nursing home. And we had no clue that that was happening. In hindsight, I remember getting a call from his dad's nursing home about a week before he died saying he was going to be moved to another floor to allow for more patients. And when I huh. think about that and what I know now, you know, it, it, it comes clear, but no one was very open or honest with what was going on. So when I saw the governor on these channels like CNN with his brother joking around about his love life and those giant infamous Q-tips, yeah. I was furious. I mean, my, my grief turned to rage. I just remember feeling so disgusted. And that's basically the day after that, I went on Tucker Carlson and I told our story and I haven't stopped. No, you certainly haven't. And, and we salute your bravery for this because as you said, Governor Cuomo was embarking upon a, just a public relations tour, right? Everywhere he went, he would have reliable stenographers and people who would put him on TV talking about how great he was. Meanwhile, your family in particular, but thousands of others in New York had the, feeling the direct repercussions of the policies that he put in place. That had to have been just unbelievably irritating. So frustrating. Yeah, first it was the poster. Oh, no, the actually, poster. first oh, he wow. had like a plastic mountain that he stood beside like he was, you know, a carnival barker, you know, like, or, or on the prices, right. You know, that big plastic mountain, like, because he was bragging about him flattening the curve. Right. So he had one of his aides make a $400 COVID death mountain plastic uh, paper mache science project. Uh, and that was insulting, but then he decided to make a poster of sort of the same thing, the graph that showed all of the cases and the fact that he had flattened the curve and all the things that he loved about himself, uh, like his sports car and his dog and his administration, all of his, the people on his administration. And then there was a picture of his daughter's boyfriend hanging off the cliff. And it was, and he sold that. And I was, I thought, my, this guy is, what an egomaniac, especially during a pandemic. And then there was the book. When I found out he was writing a book, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was one of those, you know, like The Onion or Babylon Bee or something. <laughs> what governor would write a book in the middle of a pandemic? And he did it. And then he released it in October. And it went to the New York Times bestseller list. And he was doing all of this promotion. And it was just disgusting. It was unbelievable. But I, for, for the time when the poster came out, and I remember that well, I mean, you were basically alone. I mean, the only person I remember 
of significant stature who was just absolutely all over this from the very beginning was you. And, and what we've come to find out now in particular, where there's more and more people, even from you know, his own party within uh, New York, calling him out, is that there's been a ton of different retribution from the governor himself in trying to get people to basically shut up, right? And I, I'm wondering, you had to have felt some of that, particularly on the front end of your criticism. Right at the very beginning, I heard from a person who knows the Cuomo family very well. And he wrote and said, you know, well done. You know, obviously I'm sorry for your loss and you are fighting for a, a tremendous cause, but watch your back, you know, watch your back. And I, I saw that and I actually forwarded it to my bosses and I just said, just in case, I mean, you know, seriously. yeah. Um, and I was nervous, obviously. Um, but then, you know, I would do interviews with people and they would ask the governor's office for comments and rich as a party, which is one of his spokes trolls, I call him. Um, he's just, he's just as nasty as all of them. Um, but he started asking like, well, ask Janice the exact location of where her in-laws died and the date. And I thought to myself, you're what a, you know, sort of. I don't believe you. Insinuating that you made it up? Exactly. Yeah. Or, or they wanted to, you know, call the nursing home and harass them for information on my in-laws. Whatever. Whatever the cause was, it was, you know, I wish it was. I've always waited to see if this governor or his administration would begin with, I'm really sorry for your loss. Like, like a, a normal, normal human. Movie. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Instead of like, yeah, prove it. Um, As if then, what you're looking for is some opportunity to to highlight the death of your family. I mean, that's just exactly. Insane. It's gross. Oh. It's it's gross. And then there was the the infamous comment of she's not a valid source on anything except maybe the weather. You know, they <laughs> they yeah they they said. But you know, the, all that does is just make me want to talk louder because what they're trying to do is they're trying to bully me and silence me and it's you know. It's not going to work. This is the, the meteorologist version of the stick to sports critique, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Listen, if I had a nickel for all of the, yeah, stick to the weather, weather girl, I'd be, I wouldn't have to work anymore. Nice. Well, and a healthy dose of sexism on top of it. You've got to really of appreciate course. it. That's a yeah. wonderful addition to the conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so... In, in, because you've done such a good job, and I, and I mean that sincerely, it's not just about having the courage to do it, but you've just sort of immediately articulated the problems in a clear way that people can understand and that has, has drawn people from across the ideological spectrum into taking a second look at what the governor has done here. You've gained a lot of new admirers outside of, of your Fox News uh, crew who rely on you for the weather. Um, and some of them are urging you to get into politics. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yuck. If you had told, well, if you had told me a year ago that somebody, you know, the New York post would do an article about me running for governor, I would have been like, what are you smoking? (laughs) What are you drinking? What? Um, I have never, ever been a political person ever. No one knows, you know, who I voted for. Um, I always say the only red and blue I see on a map are areas of high pressure, low pressure. Yeah. And this, you know, to me is not a political issue. The governor likes to blame it on politics, but it's not. And actually my relatives, my in-laws are registered Democrats. Um, and so, you know, for, for them to say that this is political, um, it's just, I find myself uncomfortable in this position. But having said that, I am so sick of career politicians. I'm so sick of the Andrew Cuomo's out there who feel like they're owed something. Like he, he was christened the pandemic politician. And there were rumors that he was, you know, even a greater pick than Biden for president at one point. And I feel like they get into this because they don't know anything else. And the system is so corrupt that why aren't we looking at normal everyday people like the business owner the restaurant owner the people who have had something happen to them and wanted 
to inspire change in their life and their community. So, you know, so probably not. Right. <laughs> but, you know, if somewhere down the line I felt like I could make some kind of change or difference or there was support behind something like that, then I would, I guess, have to think about it. But for now, I'm really, really happy with being the weather machine. <laughs> really happy with the job at Fox. And I've always said that I can't wait to kind of go back to, I'm out in the crowd, I'm talking about the weather, I'm, it's National Cheeseburger Day. Uh, you know, that's, that's where I'm most happiest. Well, you can, I mean, you can tell, right? It's your personality, you, you, it exudes through on those, on those reports. But, you know, I mean, that's actually an interesting subplot to this is that everybody's relied on you to the weather and and get them in a good mood and sort of have this sort of sunshine and and you know happy thoughts and then all of a sudden now you're in a very serious topic of discussion you're on Tucker Carlson as you said now you've done basically everything what was any resistance to that at Fox that that you going across sort of your typical area of expertise into an entirely different one? How would that, you know, change your audience? It's a good question. And I have to tell you, I'm so grateful to my bosses at Fox. I, I didn't, you know, obviously they knew the tragedy that had happened. And I've worked there for almost 18 years. And I really, truly feel like it's my second family. Um, and I was texting with Tucker about this when it first happened and I was telling him about what was going on and what was I, I was finding out about the governor and he said to me he's like anytime you want to come on and use my show to be a platform you are welcome and then I was also talking to my boss Lauren Pedersen about it I said you know I feel like I have to do something I've, maybe I need to write an op-ed um, you know so we were having the dialogue of what 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 I was comfortable with, what my family was comfortable with as well. Um, and like I said, when I saw, you know, the governor getting a pass on every single TV program and not being even asked the question about the nursing home, you know, that's when I decided, okay, well, maybe I need to say something. Um, but since that moment, they have been so, um, you know, uh, encouraging and supportive. And I get daily messages from you know, my bosses, Suzanne Scott, to Lauren, to, you know, all of the people that really are, are, are leaders in at Fox, and they just say, let us know what you need. And, and they also know that I'm not doing it for political reasons. Right. This is, again, not a, a Republican or a Democrat. I, if this was a Republican, I would still be vocal and, you know, sh shaking the, the rafters. But you know what? If he was a Republican, let's be honest, they he, wouldn't need me. They would, would not need me. He would have had to resign. be done. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good to hear. In a tough business that is TV news, to have folks that are, are thinking about that is, is certainly refreshing. I want to ask you where you think this leaves us today. Now we find out that the governor and his staff were fudging stats, that they were underreporting deaths, that, you know, obviously, I think even the most sort of courteous explanation you could give them is that they were trying to downplay and undercount a real problem. And I think it's probably much more aggressive than that in reality. What do you think happens to, to Governor Cuomo at this point? I mean, is, is, this, is this the end of his political career? I've asked reporters in Albany and people that have covered him for a long time, and they say he's the terminator. They think that he's still going to, like, you know, be okay after this, you know, maybe he'll take some hits at the polls. Um, but then, you know, we're a year and a half away from the election. I'm not so sure of that, though. Even the Terminator had his day, right? Yeah. And I feel like because there is bipartisan support, someone like Ron Kim, who is a Democratic lawmaker mm -hmm. who, whose uncle died in a nursing home, I'm actually very close with him. He, from the very beginning, uh, was on, you know, on the side of finding out the truth. And whereas his other Repu uh, Democratic lawmakers were very, you know, still on the side of Cuomo. But the walls have cracked a little bit. You know, there are now more reports of, you know, Ron Kim coming out and saying that he was bullied, that he was harassed, that he was threatened by the governor um, if he wasn't going to 
fall in line. And now we have more Democrats going on social media and, and writing about the fact that this guy has always been a bully. He's always been, um, you know, somebody that screams at midnight on the phone to a reporter if he doesn't like what's, what's being written about him. And the fact that Letitia James, our attorney general here in New York, who's a Democrat, came out with a 76 a page report yeah. about the nursing home tragedy. And it was not, uh, you know, it wasn't fa uh, a fawning over him at all. It was very uh, bruising in the fact that she admitted that the, you know, the numbers were severely undercounted and that his excuse of the nursing home workers being the ones that brought the virus in was probably not necessarily the case. And now that we have a federal uh, investigation and the FBI is on board uh, within the last week or so, that's, that's considerable. And there are several uh, charges that this governor um, might be convicted with. So I've always said, you know, his name is powerful, Cuomo, for decades. He's got the Democrats on his side. He has that powerful name and presence as a governor. But I have the angels on my side you know i've got i've got my you know my beloved in-laws that i believe are looking down and and wanting justice just as much as we do yeah gosh well we just can't thank you enough for doing what you're doing it's just so important and it, it's terrible that you had to suffer the loss in order to have people sort of understand what's happening there but you certainly illuminated this for millions of people across the country who are otherwise told that this guy's doing a great job so mm -hmm. before i let you go i got three important questions for you James. okay bring it on this is this is the where rubber meets the road where we get a good evaluation uh <laughs> the first one your last meal on earth what would it be it's a toss-up can I tell you both of them? Yeah, sure. Cheeseburger. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is a BLT. Okay. It's really good. It's hard to make a really good BLT. You got to get the tomato just right. You really do. It can't be mushy tomato no. and, and just the right amount of mayonnaise as well. And it can't be burnt toast. So there's, you know, there's a science to it. Uh, uh. But if it's a really good BLT, there's nothing like it. I'm going to go down that path. Do you have a particular location for, for that you get this burger or BLT? Or is it's this a homemade like, one? Well, a homemade one is good too, but I, I like someone who makes it for me. Yeah. Um, and it's usually like the, the really sort of the 50-year-old greasy spoon, yeah. you know, the one you go into and it's like there's grease on the walls and, yeah. you know, the the coffee is not that great that great but man sometimes they can just like nail that blt yep yep fair enough that sounds pretty good um uh, our second question if you weren't janice dean the weather machine and you weren't in uh television meteorology what would you be doing with yourself hmm. i love writing i mean we talked about freddie the frogcaster and i have a new book that's coming out next week um called make your own sunshine oh that's cool. uh, Yes, it's a, and it's not about me. It's about other people. It's about other people being kind to each other and being, you know, being a light in times of darkness. And I'll tell you, writing this book really helped me through some dark times, talking to these amazing people, or just your everyday people that you meet on the street, but they've, they've done something important, uh, either with a family member or somebody in their lives, um, you know, purposely or wanting to do something without any kind of fanfare. So I love doing that. And so I would have to say being a writer of some sort. I mean, I'm doing that now. I mean, are you talking about stuff that I'm not doing necessarily already? You know, it can be anything. Listen, we had Rand Paul on and he said he would be a baseball player. I don't think there's any danger of that, but you know, that was his answer. Ted Cruz said he wanted to be an actor or a point guard. I don't oh, know. Oh, wow. So it's kind of blue sky here. It's almost anything you want. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> A writer or a teacher. I think, you know, early on in my, you know, when I was thinking about careers, I wanted to be a teacher. That's great. That's great. Well, it's very on brand. Your book is very on brand from everything that we know about you. That sounds like a, a great read, particularly during a pandemic, right? A little uplifting stories about other people, inspirational. We can all use that. 
that's exactly what it is. And because it got me through a dark time, I think it can bring anybody, uh, you know, even just reading one chapter will make you feel better. Where do we order it? Oh, on Amazon. I should have known. I would have sent, I'll send you a copy of it. How about that? Oh, that's wonderful. Get it on Amazon and you'll probably see me on Fox, uh, you know, Yep. trying to, trying to sell some books. Doing your thing. (laughs) Well, we'd love to. The third and final question is a real doozy. Um, Okay. What motivates Janice Dean more? Is it the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat? Oh my. And it's basically boils down to whether you hate losing so much that that's what drives you. Oh. It's like, you know, just the joy of accomplishment. And, and it's kind of like, you know, we, we haven't even split. There's a lot of people come down on both sides of this. Well, I look at what I'm doing right now. I don't know if I'll win this battle. I really don't. But man, I'm just trying to do something for another family so that they don't have to do it. You know, they don't have to go through through something like this. So if what I am doing, this fight that I'm going through right now helps someone down the line, even if I lose, then it's worth it. That's great. That's fantastic. Listen, Janice Dean, the Weather Machine, you can check her out on Fox News anytime. She's got a new book out that you got to keep your eyes on uh, on Amazon next week, you said? Yeah, uh, March 2nd. I'll send you a copy. That's wonderful. You are the best. I cannot thank you enough for taking some time out of your busy day to talk to us. Aww. We thank you and uh, beyond measure for what you've done in New York. Thank you for your support. Uh, and it's, you know, it's people like you that, that encourage me and, and want to hear the story. That's what keeps me going. So thank you. Thanks, Janice. So what'd you think? I mean, outstanding, outstanding interview outstanding individual uh you know the courage that that janice has had uh bringing attention to this to to what cuomo has done um you know not enough can be said about that not, not enough, enough can be said about that no so I, we gotta we gotta stay on it you know we gotta stay on on cuomo um you know now that that trump is gone you know the 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 one great thing about it is the media is finally willing to have these conversations Totally. about about Democrats and their handling of the pandemic. So, I mean, God bless her for doing it. Absolutely. She's a great person. She's a great person with a ton of courage and, uh, and she's out there leading the way. You know, I mean, we've been on this topic, but, but nowhere near. I mean, we didn't exist when she started. And, uh, and anyway, very, very good. I love it. We've got a lot more really good interviews coming up, a lot of great programs coming up. And we've mm-hmm. got our eyes on the nomination of Neera Tandon We'll bring it to you as quickly as we possibly can if she happens to have a development. Yeah, I'm going to be be ready at a moment's notice for that emergency pod. Wonderful. Let's let's, uh, get out of here, Smug. So that was another great episode. And thank you all to our valued listeners. Thank you all to the Minions. So until next time, Minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. Stay ruthless. We'll see you next week. 